morning. Hopefully you've been following along with us through this journey through the Book of Roman. If you haven't, you can go to our website and catch it audio or video. It is so important to see how God used Paul to help us understand who God is, his plan for us, who we are, who we are in the sight of God, who we are apart from God. Um, Paul is, as I've shared, probably one of the greatest thinkers ever. And he establishes this book that he's written as if it was in a court of law. He asks the question, he brings the answer. And it's been phenomenal to go through. And I, I've shared, I don't know how many times I've taught this book, but every time I teach it, I learn more and more. It, 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 it fills me with um, confidence, and it helps me to remember things that we so easily forget. In this book, we look at God's sovereignty, and to ignore God's sovereignty would be absolutely criminal, but to ignore human responsibility would be equally criminal, and one does not stop the other. And so many people want to put division in this. And if you want to read and grab verses alone in this book, it's easily to make division in this. But if you read it evenly, like you have to read all scripture, the intent becomes clear. And God's sovereignty and human responsibility are beautifully blended in the word of God. Now, after talking about God's sovereignty in the, his past dealings with Israel, last chapter, Paul goes on to speak on God's fairness in his present dealings with Israel. As I shared, these last, uh, the last one, this one, and the next one, God is basically speaking of Israel, but we definitely connect in this as being part of his church. Let's look at it together. Chapter 10, verse one. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. Last chapter, we saw Paul saying is that I would be willing to be damned, to spend eternity in hell, to have the Jewish people saved. And I look at that and I'm in awe of it. I'm in awe of it. And I've shared, I love you guys. Love my family. I don't know if I would be willing to be damned for anyone and be apart from Christ. This love that Paul has should inspire you and me to be better witnesses in the world that we live in. If Paul was willing to be willing to be damned to have his people saved, can we at least share the knowledge of Christ with those that we love and the people that we know? To this day, the Jews are zealous for God. Paul had great zeal for God when he persecuted the church. He was going around to try to establish his own self-righteousness. And like the majority of Israel, he was sincere. But the problem was, he was sincerely wrong. Because someone sincere about something doesn't mean that they're right about what they're sincere about. Ever since Israel returned to their land from Babylonian captivity, they learned a lesson there. And the nation had been cured of idolatry. They got rid of their idolatry. In the temple and the loyal synagogues, only the true God was worshipped and served. And only the true law was taught. So zealous were these, zoo, these Jews that they tried to improve on God's law. And that's where they got in trouble. They added their own traditions. And they made those traditions equal to the law. Paul himself had been zealous for the law and the traditions. But their zealousness was not properly based on knowledge. Sad to say, many religious people today, they make the same mistake. I've watched a lot of Christian people fall into legalism. They think that what they're doing is good work and religious deeds. And they begin to think that those deeds and those works are what's saving them. And it's actually these practices that keep them from being saved or keep others from being saved. Without a doubt, many of them are very sincere. We watch the effort that goes in to some of these false religions around us. 
knocking on door to door to door, riding amount of miles on a bike to get quotas, to, to, to try to earn levels of heaven. Christian science is the greatest joke on the face of the earth. And brilliant people and billionaires are spending all this money to try to get to a level of utopia that's man-made. When they get there, there's not God in it. There hasn't been God in it from the beginning. But human nature wants to do that. How do I earn my next level? How do I get to this place? And it suckers people in. Many of them are very devout and sincere. But their devotion will never save them. The mindset that I am a good person is one of the most dangerous mindsets to salvation. It's the hardest one for me to reach as I share the gospel. When I share the gospel with customers and people that I work with and people on the street, the person that truly feels that they're a good person based on what they see around them is the hardest person for me to witness to. I have to try to break that down. I have to share what the word of God says about humans apart from Christ Jesus. I have to share that every person, even if they outwardly don't show sin, they inwardly think sin. It's hard. Some of them just will not move from that, and you can't reach them for the Lord until they do. Verse three, for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. Can I get an amen? Did you hear what I just said? Christ has settled the purpose for what the law was put here to do. We don't live for salvation through the law. The law is the signpost that sends us to what we need, and that's the Savior. Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. The law is not bad. And by loving God, we should obey the law. I have a person right now that feels that we're not saved in this church because we're not having church on Saturday. The Sabbath is Saturday. We're not having church on the Sabbath. And he's convinced that none of us are going to heaven. It's a guy that was raised in the church. And you go, man, that's just ridiculous. It's so common you can't believe it on different levels. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. How are we made right with God? By what Christ had already accomplished. Israel was ignorant of God's righteousness. Not because they never were told. They were told better than any human race but they refused to listen. This is not an ignorance that comes from a lack of opportunity. As I said, no nation had a better opportunity than Israel. In their case, the ignorance stemmed from willful, stubborn resistance to the truth. The same thing that humans do today. They will not submit to God. I, I have people in my life, there's a woman that I'm thinking of, I would never mention a name. She has the greatest gift of hospitality I've ever seen. She's just a doll. She loves me. She doesn't trust the Lord. She refuses. She wants to argue religion every time we sit down. And I know that arguing religion with her is never gonna solve the problem. I always tell her that I have no excuse for what man has done with religion. But if you would truly study the words of Christ, I dare you to find fault. And that normally ends the argument and then I just get to love on her. But she will not allow any human being or any God lord over her. She just won't allow it. She's seen it, she's lived with it, she has people around her that love the Lord, family members that love the Lord but she will not allow that in her life. I never give up on her. I love her and I keep praying and I keep hoping that she sees the people that are around her that love the Lord and what God does in their life and sees what happens to the people that they don't. But there is a blindness in those that don't know the Lord or refuse the Lord. The Jews became proud of their good works just like humans do today. I'm a good person. 
They had a religious self-righteousness. They could not admit their sin, and they would not trust a Savior. Paul had made this very same mistake before he met the Lord, Philippians 3.1. You need to understand that everything about the Jewish religion points to the coming Messiah. Every single thing. Their sacrifices, the priesthood, the temple services, the religious festivals, the covenants, their law told them that they were sinners in need of a savior. Everything about the Old Testament told them that there was a coming Messiah. But instead of letting the law bring them to Christ, Galatians 3.24 tells us they worshiped the law and rejected the savior. The law is a sign we come to a signal and it's red, that's a sign to stop. The law was a sign and it pointed when to go, when to stop. But it could never take them to the destination. The law can't give righteousness. It only leads a sinner to the Savior who can give righteousness. And legalism is so easily fallen into because it fits our nature. We, we feel comfortable in it. Verse five, for Moses writes, the law's ways of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. If the law is the way that we're gonna be saved, you can never break the law. There's not one of us that can make it a day without falling short of the perfect God. If you think that you can, you're sinning for thinking like that. On the law, you know, this is amazing. On the day the law came down, Moses with the tablets, the nation of Israel, in waiting for Moses to come down, carves calves made out of bronze. And they began dancing around naked, worshiping a bronze calf, while the law is being built for human beings. And Moses comes down, and the day that the law came down from Mount Sinai, 3,000 were struck and dead. Exodus 32, 28. But you know what happened when the Spirit of God descended upon us at Pentecost? 3,000 were saved. Legalism in your life, in our churches, in our communities, will always lead to death because nobody can fulfill its righteousness. The Spirit in your life, in our churches, in our communities, will always lead to life because it's the finished work of Christ. When he said it's finished, it didn't mean that Joseph Smith had to come along and add to it. Oh, pastor, you've offended us. Good. You should be. When Christ says it's finished and you want to add something to it by some knucklehead, which he was, and Thousands and hundreds of thousand people are sucked into this work-based religion and they're lost. And somebody better tell them. You know, don't maybe as harsh as I've just done it, but somebody better tell them. I'll share a little bit more in a minute how to do that. But let's move on. Verse six. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart, who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth? And don't say, who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again? In fact, say, in fact, in fact, it says, the message is very close at hand, and it's on your lips and in your heart. And the message is that the very message about faith that we preach, the message is about the faith. Basically, Paul is saying, don't go looking for salvation in different places and weird religions and weird cults are coming up to get Christ there or going down to get Christ there. It's right before your very face. It's right before your very asking. And yet, false religions would like to send you over here for Christ or send you over there for Christ or, or, or confuse you or, you know, as in our Mormons, they tell you that Christ was, was created and he was a brother of Lucifer and you don't hear that when they come knocking on the door and use the name of Christ. It weaves in, it's a snake, it's a lie, it's out of the pit of hell. Well, if you're here for the first time, man, your pastor's rough. To not speak the truth 
And to allow people to be comfortable and that type of thing is not love. Look, I pray for them. I pray for them. It breaks my heart, the amount of zeal and commitment that they put in to a false god, to a false religion. Paul indicates here the fact that Christ had come into into the world in the flesh and he had been resurrected and there was no need for anyone to ask to bring Christ down from heaven or to bring Christ from the dead. He had already come. He had already been resurrected. The message of righteousness by faith was now available to all human beings. And that's what Jesus accomplished by taking the sins of us to the cross with him. This was not hard, but they made it hard. Haven't you noticed those that reject Christ make it hard? It's so simple, and they're making it so difficult. And people are rejecting Christ. The road to hell is wide, and the road to heaven is narrow. I wish it was the other way. But Christ is not going to drive, Christ will not drag any of us into heaven to spend eternity with him. You know, how can, how can a loving God send people to hell? He didn't send them to hell. They chose hell. He's going to spend eternity with every one of us that have asked him to be Lord and Savior of their lives. He doesn't want to spend eternity with somebody that's rejected him. Would you want him to? And if I'm going to spend eternity with Christ, do I don't want to be there with a lot of people that have rejected Christ along with me? If I got to, it's bad enough to have to spend this life with people that have rejected Christ. Now, if you think about this, this is what religion does in so many times when it gets away from Christ. The Jews started out with the Torah. It was the first five books of the Bible. Moses' Law, it could be written on only 350 pages. Think about what I'm telling you here, okay? Because I don't want you to miss this. Then then they added the Mishra. And then they added the Mishnah. And then they added the Gemara. And by the time they were finished with the Talmud, they had 523 books, not 35 pages. 523 books and 22 volumes of law. Two things that are hardest for a Jew is to accept in accepting Christ is they, they struggle with his incarnation, that's God coming into a human form, and his resurrection. It's just too much. They won't accept it in their minds. Yet the Jews and every human being must accept this if they want to be saved. We are saved by faith. God-given faith, but we're saved by faith. Now, if we look close to these next couple verses, 9 and 10, these are great verses to be able to share with the lost. If you want to have some bookmarks in your Bible, let me read them for you. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not by following the Catholic book or the Mormon book or this book or that book. or <laughs> It doesn't say that, guys. It doesn't say that. Verse 10, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it's by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Why did God pick the heart? Why didn't Paul say believe in your mind? It seems like the Lord's after our heart first. We know from Mark 12, 30, you shall love the Lord with your heart and your mind and your strength and your soul. Heart is put first. You know, our minds can sway so easily. What we thought about someone yesterday, we get more facts and then we were wrong or we thought that we knew something and we were, it wasn't what it was and our, our minds are all over the place all the time. We get a new set of facts and our minds are completely different, but our heart holds on. Have you ever heard that love is blind? Lucky for me, Val loves me with her heart and not her eyes. 
Verse 11. As scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Paul quoted Isaiah 28, 16. Isaiah 28, 16. Whosoever believe on him shall not be ashamed. Paul makes it clear in Romans that salvation is by faith. We believe in the heart, receive God's righteousness, and then confess Christ openly without shame. It's important. There are people that have been saved, they got saved in church, but they never told anyone. Or they were embarrassed, or they held back in that. And this is why I'll ask anyone on, on an altar call that raised their hand to please go over and meet with the prayer team and share with them what God has done in you and let them give you a Bible and encourage you and, and do that. But one of the reasons I do that is I want them to openly confess that they've asked Jesus to be Lord of their life. It's important. The Bible tells us to do that. I love teaching and sharing God's word. Why? Because it works. I get to see life changes, families put back together, people that are unrecognizable for who they were when they come to the Lord, the way that they think differently and the things that they do differently. Some of you guys I knew before you came to the Lord, and every day is a joy for me to see you do things you wouldn't have done five years ago, three years ago, two years ago, to see a change of heart, to see God controlling your life. It works. We never have to think, will it work? I hope it works. It will. Whoever submits to Jesus' lordship will never be ashamed. His work guarantees it. It doesn't matter if anyone doesn't like it or the world doesn't like it. We never have to be ashamed for doing what's right. <clears throat> Verse 12. The Jews and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone, now the word everyone means everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, do we see the human responsibility here? For humans to be saved, they have to call upon the Lord. Now, does he know who's going to call on the Lord and who's not going to call on the Lord? Absolutely. He sees the beginning and the end. He saw you before you were in, when you were in your mother's womb. God's foreknowledge is absolutely incredible, but there's human responsibility. That's love demands choice. He didn't create us robots. Now, there's a huge difference between the righteousness that comes from the law and the righteousness that comes from faith. And Warren Wiersbe did a chart here, and I really liked it. So righteousness through the law was only for the Jews, but through faith, it's whosoever. And righteousness through the law is based on works. But through faith, it comes by faith alone. Righteousness by the law is self-righteousness. By faith, it's God's righteousness. Righteousness through the law cannot save. Righteousness through faith brings salvation. Righteousness through law, obey the Lord. Righteousness through faith is call upon the Lord. Righteousness through the law means to pride all of every time. Righteousness through faith glorifies God and the things that we do that are good. There is no good thing in you and me that's not a him. We compare the law to faith. We see so many people drawn back into this type of self-righteousness. I, I, it's hard for me to get it. Why? people want to go back into the Old Testament law. And I watch it all the time. It's like, it, it's a pride thing. It's, they find things in the Old Testament and they want to build theologies off of it. They want to go back to the Old Covenant. Look, we failed the Old Covenant. That's what makes the New Covenant so beautiful. They want to be underneath that. It's like, if it hurts, it must be good for me. And anyone in this church that's been here for a while uses my best, knows of my best illustration for this. And I'm sorry if you have to hear it again, but it's my illustration. When I was training for Mr. California, it was constant pain. 
You, you heavy up all year long and lift massive weights, all that your joints can handle to build size. And then the last six months, you do nothing but reps and you just burn the muscle for development and, 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 and so the, the look is there. And before a contest, you're, you're basically starving down all of the fat in your body, maintaining as much muscle as you can, and the regimen is insane. You're taking as much sun as you can take that your human body will take because that shows muscularity without burning the skin off of your body. Right before a contest, you take four days of no carbohydrate at all. You starve yourself from carbohydrates. Your body goes into a starvation mode. Six hours before the contest, you, carb you, you load carbs. And by loading the carbs, your body goes insane. Every vein in your arms comes out. You can see veins through your necks, down to your legs. And this is all preparing for one day for a stupid trophy that I don't even own anymore. But the pain that was involved in being the best, to being better, that never taking a bite of anything that would allow me not to be the very best that I could be for that contest, the discipline that went on, and the mindset is that if it hurts and it's painful, it's got to even be better for me. And I remember out on the beach about a week before a contest and trying to get better tan, darker than, you, you didn't know what nationality I was. And walking on the beach, and it was literally burning my feet. It was so hot. And I remember thinking, man, this must be good for me because it really, really hurts. We laugh at how stupid that is, but how easily we fall into a mindset. If loving God really, really hurts, it must be better. And that's not the relationship God wants with us. It's a loving relationship. He doesn't want your feet hurting, guys. It's not the God that we serve. The next couple verses, we're gonna see some of the back and forth debate Paul um, is using in the synagogues. Verse 14, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them about him? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messenger who brings good news, or in other verses, or preach the gospel of peace. Christ came with these beautiful feet over 2,000 years ago, and now it's your and my privilege and our responsibility to go with beautiful feet to a dying world, to bring the good news, to preach the gospel, to preach this gospel of peace in a world that has no peace. Money can't give people peace. Prestige can't give people peace. Nothing can. We're one, we're one day from hearing that there's some critical disease that we have that we never knew we had. We're one day from hearing that, you know, we're having an earthquake that takes out California. We're one day away from hearing that the economy's gonna crash or the government's gonna fail or, you know, where, where is the peace in the world that we live in? What has total peace in this world? What have you found? Alcohol, drugs, sex, money, prestige, jobs? If you guys have gotten a chance to watch on the History Channel, The Mystery of the Abandonment, you cannot believe throughout history how many things look like they were impenetrable, that they would last forever. Billions of dollars are spent on cities and, and projects, and, and they got trees growing through the concrete. They're falling apart. There's nothing left. Nobody knows what they're for or why they were there. All this money and everything to give people peace in these situations, the, these, these uh, enormous situations, and it takes someone to have to go figure out what it was even about years later. A lot of this stuff in our lifetime. Where do we find peace in the world that we live in? We have it. The peace spoken of is a peace with God. Romans 5.1. And the peace with Christ has been achieved. And there's been a peace now between the Jews and the Gentiles forming one body. No difference. The Jews that are saved, 
the Gentiles that are saved. The cure for Israel's rejection is hearing the word of the gospel and believing on Jesus Christ. We must never minimize the missionary outreach of the church body. That's not the pastor or the elders. The church body is you guys, us. Now, again, I said that these verses, you know, relate primarily to Israel, but it, it applies to all people and all lost people in the world. They can't be saved unless they get called upon the Lord. And they can't be called upon unless they believe. And faith comes by hearing, so they must hear the message. We are part of that scenario. How are they going to hear, guys? A messenger has to go to them. They have to come to them with the right message, not some sincere thing that's, that's not right. This means God must call the messenger, and the messenger must be sent. What a privilege it is to be one of his messengers and have what's considered beautiful feet. A lot of people are unnecessarily depressed and discouraged. And one of the reasons can be that they're just not sharing the gospel. They're not fulfilling their purpose. They end up self-absorbed, self-focused. And there's no way a selfish person can ever have peace. There just isn't enough in this world to satisfy them. I've really lived a privileged life. I worked hard my whole life. There really was nothing out of my reach. I was never given anything. I, I earned enough money to buy my first mini bike. I earned enough money to buy my first, you know, used truck. I always worked hard, made enough money that I could buy. I could have bought the Learjet. I just couldn't afford the gas. I, I, I had strived to have the newest and the best, and every time I thought I had it, months later something better came out, leaving me always unsatisfied. Nothing this world ever had, and I was blessed to have a lot. Nothing ever filled a hole that only God could fill. The um, construction company that the Lord allowed me to build, I, I, I spent 15 years that it, in, you know, working in my dad's gym that was supposed to be mine after 15 years, and divorces happened and things happened, and it got taken away from me. And I stepped out without any construction knowledge or anything and learned the trade. And ended up picking up Starbucks, Noah's Bagels, Chevy's Restaurants, Home Depots. Valerie could have a new car every year. Anything she wanted. We could do anything we wanted. And yet we were never less satisfied. We were never more empty. It was only when we gave our life to the Lord that that hole was able to be filled. That stuff all has to be fixed and repaired and stored and kept out of the sun. And it, it, that stuff wears you out. Only the Lord can fill. Only the Lord can fill the hole that He created in every one of us. I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade my life with Him now for everything this world has to offer, because nothing this world has to offer can compare to what He is when He's filling that hole in your life. So, you got beautiful feet? Are you feeling it? Do you have lively feet? Are your feet happy? I get, I get pretty sore at this age. Share the wonderful good news about the gospel. It's so fun for me to watch one of the men that's going to share at a men's breakfast. I love it. Their little feet are going 200 miles an hour. They're so excited, you know, well, what should, you know, what should we do? What can we tell them? And, and their little feet are just going like that. And I think, and it just, I got the picture of these beautiful, happy, active feet. That's what it's like when you get to share the Lord, when you get to do what you were created to do. Verse 16, but not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. But I ask, have the people of Israel actually heard the message? Answer, yes, they have. The message had, 
has gone through the whole earth and the words to all the world. In Acts 5, we saw that it said, you have filled Jerusalem with the word. And in Acts 17, you have turned this world upside down. This is what they had saw as witnesses to the message. Where did this all come from? Three and a half years of Jesus' teaching. Three and a half years of Jesus' teaching has turned the world upside down. And that very same teaching is what we look at today. And it turned our world upside down. Verse 19, but I asked, did the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. For even in the times of Moses, God said, I will rouse your jealousy through people who are not even a nation. I will provoke your anger through the foolish Gentiles. In the past, God's saying, I chose you. I chose you, nation of Israel. Then I made myself known to you through Christ. But you rejected me, Israel, so I'm going to provoke you. I'm going to bring these Gentiles into my family. And so you can see what you missed out on. When you ignored the opportunity to be saved, when my chosen people denied me, okay, look what happens to the people that didn't deny me. And, I, and in my sense, I'm always hoping family members that won't trust Christ, they'll can see, they can see what's going on with their children compared to my children. They can see the decisions that I make compared to what the decisions that they're making, that they can see that there's a difference. They can see how God has blessed me. And it would be something that would make them want to come to them. Your actions are worth a thousand words, church. What you do, what pe people watch you. And what you do and how you handle things, you can praise the Lord and hallelujah and Jesus this and Jesus that, but if it doesn't line up to the way you live, it means nothing. Now whether you're talking to the Jews, the Mormons, or the Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses, or the Christian science, we should be provoking them to jealousy by sharing the freedom we have in Christ Jesus because they don't have that kind of freedom. They're under work-based Religion and worst work based religion is exhausting. And you've heard me say it a thousand times, and I'll say it a thousand more. If riding my bike is getting me to heaven, did I miss it by 25 miles? If praying's getting me to heaven, did I miss praying by 15 minutes? If giving's getting to heaven, did I, did I hold back $40 and am I missing heaven? For, how, how would you ever rest in a work based ministry? How would you ever rest in a work-based relationship with anyone? Never forget, the work of the cross is complete. All that's left for us to do is respond and enjoy this relationship you and me have with the Lord. So when you talk to the Jehovah Witness, he has his black book knocking on his quota for doors that he knocked on. And he talked to him, say, hey, I'm just enjoying the Lord today. How are you doing? How's it working for you? Did you knock on enough doors today? Are you sure of your salvation? I am. And when you talk to Jehovah Witness or the Mormon who's pedaling down the street, I'm so glad that I don't have to wear a suit and tie and pedal my bike down the street to get to heaven. If that's what it took to please God, there's power when we talk about the finished work of the cross. It's my greatest defense. I don't argue religion with them. They know the Bible. They've studied it way better than you and me have. They've grabbed certain verses and built a theology, and they'll hammer you. And they don't want to hear about what you're going to tell them. You've got to go to the most inner part of them. Do you have the peace in the Lord that I have and trusting Christ Jesus. It's like putting a glass of cold water before someone that's dying of thirst. Isaiah prophesies this 750 years ago, give or take. Verse 20, and later Isaiah spoke boldly for God, saying, I was found by people who were not looking for me, and I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. 
He prophesies this of God. In Isaiah 65, 1, I, Israel, I, it, ugh, told Israel that God would be found by those who did not seek him. This was one of the predictions that the Gentiles would become part of God's family. We didn't find God, church. He came and got us. The Bible's clear of it. They were told that. The testimony of these people help us to understand that we should not be so amazed that Israel, for the most part, has rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was foretold that he would. God was saying what he would have to do because of that before it ever happened. He's God. He sees the beginning and he sees the end. Verse 21. But regarding Israel, God said, all day long I opened my arms to them, but they were disobedient and rebelled. You know, God wants to use this to share the gospel with both Jews and Gentiles. God can use our feet, our arms, just like he used Paul. Jesus wept over Jerusalem and longed to gather his people in his arms. But do you know what happened? Those arms were stretched out on a cross. And yet he was still willing to die for Jews and Gentiles alike. There is no greater love. As the worship team comes up, our God is long-suffering. He's so patient with you and me. And the word of God tells us that he's not willing that any should perish. It doesn't say that he created those to be damned. It says he's not willing that any should perish. You've got to keep this thing in balance. He knows who's going to be damned. He sees the choices that they made. God came for us and gave us everything we knew and needed to accept him. But we still had the ability to reject him. We're all in a place that we can come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. The question comes up, and many think, is God done with Israel? Has his patience ran out? Is there any future for this nation? Yes, there is. The Bible's very clear. And the next chapter is going to absolutely confirm that. There are religious systems that right now say that we are now Israel, and Israel doesn't exist. That's, that's false religion. It's not true. It goes against what the Bible says. God's promise to Israel will never be broken. It doesn't mean that they're not being punished for their disobedience, but his promise to them will never be broken. God doesn't break promises. When, God, when Christ comes back, Israel's going to recognize their Savior. They're going to go, oh my goodness, what were we thinking? The Antichrist is going to be revealed for who he is, their eyes are going to be open and they're going to have to run for the hills. There's consequences for the rejection of God. There's consequences for you and me in disobedience. If you're a good parent, there better be consequences for your children when they're disobedient. Otherwise, you allow them to go on in that disobedience. And it, that disobedience, as they get older, takes their lives many times. But for the Jew today, just like you and me, they need to trust in God's provision. And that is the only Savior, Jesus Christ. He tells us that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If that's not true, this is a waste of time today. If anything Christ said is not truth, all of it's a waste of time. This is not my interpretation of the Bible you know, I, I hear this to the non-believer. Well, that's how you interpret it. Th that's not my interpretation. That's not how I teach. I teach the Bible line upon line, and I let the Bible teach what it is. People that grab a verse here and grab a verse there and grab a verse here and grab a verse there and pull a theology out and teach that, they're doing that. They're interpreting it the way they want to. The way the Calvary Chapel teaches the Bible, I fell in love with the first day I walked in. Because teaching all of God's word proves what God is saying. That's the importance of it. It really is simple, but it's so amazing. Would you stand with me? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May your week with him be sweet and tender. 
Father, don't let us get so busy that we forget that you desire a relationship with us. You don't force a relationship with us. You didn't make us yes puppets. You gave us a choice to love you. And you deserve all of us, Lord, all that we have. Don't let us forget that, Lord. Help us to remember to be so grateful and for you to be the priority of our life. Father, don't let us get up in the morning. Don't let these feet touch the ground until we've asked you to fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, enabling us, Lord, to live this life that you deserve. We thank you for your law. We thank you for showing us righteousness. And we thank you for making a way when we failed to be seen whole because we know that you're holy. We love you, Lord. You deserve our best. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. God bless you guys.